love you. We love you, Robbie. I'm oh, not sorry, that's what you say, isn't it? So, good evening, my name's Robbie Coltrane, and I am Scottish. <laughs> I've got what they call a refined Scottish accent. <laughs> there are Scottish accents all over the world, of course. There is the California Scots. Hey, you guys, do you fancy coming down to the ocean for tea talk? <laughs> <laughs> There's Chinese Edinburgh. Oh, Robbie, I can't stand working in Edinburgh during the international conference. <laughs> if I follow the foreigners, can? The Pakistani Glaswegian. Oh, dear goodness, what the hell is Sooners thinking of <laughs> Singing down Catholic up to play for the bloody jerks. Brezhnish, I, I thought you were a Muslim. Am I? I'm a Protestant Muslim. <laughs> My favourite Scottish voice at the moment has got to be Jimmy Knapp. I think Jimmy Knapp could uh, pretty well negotiate his way out of anything. <laughs> probably with the, the devil, I think he'd probably win, you know? Eh, uh, excuse me, Beelzebub. <laughs> Whatever your name is. Me and the members are the opinion that the working temperature down here is clearly in excess of the upper limits. <laughs> as stipulated by the Health and Safety Act in 1874. Basic <laughs> voices, that, that, they immediately have authority. It's like the guy who goes, this is the nine o'clock news from the BBC with somebody who's incredibly overpaid. <laughs> the Americans train all their media people to very bass, boomy voices, like Donahue. Good afternoon, this is Donahue. Murder, incest, rape, and drug abuse. But enough of my weekend. On the show tonight. <laughs> on the show tonight, matricide. What's it like to kill your mother, and why do people do it? Gary, why did you kill your mother? Well, I was in two minds as to whether to kill my father or to kill my mother, but you did patricide last week, so I thought, what the hell, I'll kill my mother. <laughs> we'll be back after these messages. If you think that's cruel, you try watching the nature programs. I used to watch them all the time. Hans and Lottie Hass, do you remember then? And the little fishes go around the wreck searching for tiny organisms to eat. And then the big sharp comes up, and aren't those fishes glad they can move so quickly? <laughs> I fancy Lottie like mad. Something about that black bikini. Well, why did she go up with that boring bastard? <laughs> Nowadays, watching nature programs is more like watching horror films. They always come on while you're having your tea. Have you noticed that? They always start off innocently enough. Here's a fish with a little light on the end of its antenna, and you see it going around, and you think, oh, that's handy. Flash, 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 flash. <laughs> Lucky fish. It'll be able to see its way around the bottom of the sea. <laughs> and then about two inches behind the wee light, you see, I'm waiting for something to eat. <laughs> but the wee crayfish doesn't know that. It goes, <laughs> oh, there's a light. That's handy. It'll not get mugged here. <laughs> they never do it cleanly. They never kill them instantly, do they? They're always hanging there going, oh, please, God, let me out. <laughs> and that's why they spend all their time disguising themselves as other things, like bits of rock and little bits of coral and hiding under the sand. But there's so much shite down there on the bottom. I better rephrase that one. <laughs> there's so much garbage down there on the bottom of the sea that in two million years they'll be rushing around going, Look, there it is, the discarded Zanuzzi fridge fish. It opens its jaws, on comes a light, and it's good night Vienna for the sardines. And look, there's an unusual one. There it is, the used condom with a nut in it fish. I wouldn't go near that one, Lottie. <laughs> Welcome to 21 glorious years of border television. Where does the time go? It seems like only yesterday that I sat down in this very studio for border television's very first broadcast. Here is the border news. <laughs> A Langham farmer, as yet unnamed, was today involved in what an eyewitness described as an accident. Details at this stage are hazy, but it is certain that he may or may not be slightly injured. <laughs> we understand that currently he may or may not be receiving treatment in one of these four hospitals. <laughs> Anyone requiring further details is advised to ring directory inquiries. <laughs> Well, our first broadcast. I know it looks a bit raw nowadays, but in those days, we didn't have the technology we do now. Of course, we didn't just have news. Far from it. There were news flashes, bulletins, what have you, like this item from 1974. 
Just six years after what was described at the time as a bit of an accident, the authorities have released the name of the man involved, Edwin McGrory. His name is Edwin McGrory. And he was not treated at any of these hospitals. But rather was nursed at home by his as yet unnamed wife, Marjorie McGrory. <laughs> How fashions change. Did we really wear those shirts? And that's not all. In 1983, borders screamed into the 80s. Hello. Today is the 15th anniversary of what has become known as the McGrory Accident Incident. Mr. McGrory spent the day relaxing with relatives and close friends and is reported to be delighted that the whole affair is now behind him. His combine harvester is now in this shed. These are only selected highlights of the past 21 years. I'm sorry if we've left out your favourite moment. I hope we'll still be here in another 21 years' time. I know I will be, because I live here. It's the only place I'll ever get a job. Good night. <laughs> As they pass us, old Grant. Sold on its way, Siegfried. I say, this does indeed seem to be the most ample repast, Caroline, does it not, James? More than ample, I should say, Siegfried. Yes. So, James, did you stick your hand up the Merryweather's car's bum this morning? <laughs> indeed, I did, Siegfried. Up the bum with the old hand, scraped it out a treat. Yeah. Oh, well, said it, James, you can't beat a hand up a clammy car's slippery sphincter to set the appetite raging. <laughs> Always said it, Siegfried, never wrong. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, did I ever tell you about the time that old Rob Thistlethwaite's prize Friesian was carving up the North Field? Hmm? Had my hand up and down that beast's backside more time than a prize ever in a stud farm, didn't I, Caroline? <laughs> Siegfried, do you mind if we change the conversation? Oh, I never thought, darling. How very inconsiderate of us not to think of you. Yes, perhaps there's something else about which we could talk. Absolutely. Absolutely. I say, everybody, guess who I bumped into in the village today? Who? Joss McKinley. Uh, Oh, well, Joss, how is he? Well, you know, old Joss, darling, never taken a day off work himself, no. I'm afraid it's his Airedale he's worried about. Ragger, what's wrong with him? Well, apparently he's got the squitters rather the badly. <laughs> <laughs> Poor old Joss has been up all night with them, can't do a thing. Came down this morning, kitchen floor covered with his stuff, up the walls, down the hall, all the carpets ruined. Poor beast apparently is dropping buckets of the stuff. <laughs> Round poor Joss off. Yeah. Oh, I say. <laughs> Very good, Jem. Brown off. Brown off. Get it, darling. Brown off. <laughs> I bet Joss hit the roof. Oh, well, that's not all. So did poor old Ragger. Hit the roof, hit the curtain rail, hit it. <laughs> do you know, I reckon the only thing to do with him is take him down to the knacker's yard and have him boiled up with all the other dead dogs. Uh, talking of abattoirs, that reminds me of the time the Inchmore farm found worms in their milking herd. And we had to take the whole lot out to be slaughtered. Do you remember? Ah. <sighs> The words we pulled out of those cows' bums must have been this long. So and this thick. Put your arm in, pulled out handful. Uh, put it in again, pull out even more. And the diarrhea. Yes. Gravy, James? Thank you. <laughs> I'm not kidding you, Siegfried. It must have been ten feet up the walls of the milking shed. That's right, Helen. Pull it up, there may be a sixpence in it. James, please, I, I really do think this conversation. Oh, you're absolutely right, right Helen. She's absolutely right, James. We've been both thoughtless and crude. Siegfried is right. We will talk of our work no more at the dinner table. That is our sworn promise, is it not, Siegfried? Absolutely sworn on the oath of death, old man Dredd. Right, let's get on with lunch. Shall I serve? Giblets and brie. Scotland Yard. So called because it is neither in Scotland nor is it a yard. in Scotland Yard, in a box in the corner in an old broom cupboard, are the records of cases. 
epistories of every branch of the law, from larceny to being a blood relative of Keith Chagrin. <laughs> yes, all of these cases have been covered by Edgar Duskarton, who now presents another story of Scotland Yard. Good evening. Tonight, the headless corpse of Haringey. We've done that one. <laughs> Tonight, the limbless limbo dancer of Leytonstone. Yeah, done him twice. The silent stiffy of Stanmore. <laughs> Good evening. Tonight, the silent stiffy of Stanmore. <laughs> Good help. Ooh. What about the body? Well, sir, it looks like she put up a bit of a fight. Indeed she had. But not enough to prevent the murderer from severing her subclavicle artery and leaving a three-millimeter deep indentation in her cranial cortex. <laughs> I managed to scrawl a tiny illegible clue as to her identity. <laughs> that doesn't help us very much, does it? Hang on a minute, sir. What is it? Looks like a blood stain. Fresh, too. Blood? Right. Inspector Johns went to work immediately. A mild solution of ammonia and warm water managed to loosen the stain, whilst a damp cloth and blotting paper brought it to the surface. Before long, he had got rid of it. <laughs> right. Let's get her down to the boys at the path lab. Get onto the pavement. You're right there. Oh, I can't. Oh. What have you found, Ted? Something very interesting, Tony. If you mix the egg white with a little sugar before popping in the pan, you'll make perfect souffles every time. <laughs> Whilst dissecting the slightly decomposing corpse, splattering himself with lymphoid tissue and pancreatic acids, which spurted in a magnificent redness, he realised he had discovered a bullet. So, now we know that the deceased was either shot by a bullet fired from a gun, or else she threw herself at over 200 miles an hour on a <laughs> What about the murderous prince? Yeah. 19th century hunting scenes. Anything else? Yes. Using her dental records, we've managed to construct a detailed model of her lower jaw. And a model of a little ship, which fits easily into a bottle. <laughs> what about the killer himself? Who was this man whose warped mind derived pleasure from repeatedly plunging a knife through skin into tissue, into blood, into sinew, through vital organs? The inspector felt he was banging his head against a brick wall. <laughs> it's a time like these that every detective needs his share of luck. And Inspector Johns was about to take delivery of his. Cigarette? Yes. Good. I always like a second opinion. So you think you may have seen the murderer leaving the scene? That's right, Inspector. I was walking past the victim's house a few days ago when... Oh, what a lovely day for a murder. For Armada. What a lovely day for a Spanish Armada. <laughs> Tom, we've got him. Meet me at the yard in five minutes. Right, Inspector. Get out the road, get out the road. I'm getting on the car. Quick, right. Hang on, miss me. The man's a damn psychopath. Me too. Oh, oh. <laughs> So the police finally caught up with the fiendish killer of the silent stiffy of Stanmore. But this was a killer that was to elude the clutches of the law. Good night. Edgar Duskarton, I arrest you in the name of the law. Edgar Duskarton, I arrest you in the name of Edgar Duskarton. Yes, that's better. That's all the credits. Can't I have just one more? No. Come on. Our policeman's truncheon is no friend of the skull. 
Shut up, Gus Carlton. <laughs> a policeman's knee is no friend of the groin. Shut up, Gus There was a horror in the house, but no one dared to speak its name. One by one, they found out about the horror and the room where the horror lay. No one ever went there. No one dared enter, but one day, a stranger came and no one warned him. He went in and never realized the room was out of toilet paper. Starring Robbie Coltrane as The Stranger. Let's go to the end. Meryl Streep as the toilet seat. <laughs> Based upon a true story. <laughs> oh, hi. Well, I mean, I knew there was trouble as soon as they walked into the joint. I thought, hey, I got a bit of a rumpus starting here. Twelve of them on a boys' night out. No reservation or nothing like that. <laughs> Apparently, they'd been to 111 Bread You Like earlier in the evening and got out of the way, horizontally. So I offered them a window table and two by the bar, but they said they all wanted to sit together. On one side of the table, if you please. <laughs> I lost 12 covers. Apparently, some guy was coming in to paint them later which I was not too happy about neither because it meant I had to put Mrs. Schwartz by the kitchen door with her sciatica, I say. <laughs> Still, at last we got them all settled and then I had to take down the order. Well, what a shamazzle that was. First of all, the one in charge, Beardy Boy, right? He wants the dish of the day. So they all want the dish of the day. <laughs> and he changes his mind and he says he'll have the set menu. So then they all change their minds and say they'll have the set menu also. <laughs> And then he says, forget that. Do we have chicken soup? Do we have chicken soup <laughs> in a place like this? No. <laughs> so I hand the bread basket round to this beardy guy. Does he slice it like a normal person? Uh-uh. He has to start breaking it all over the other ones. And I thought, hey, this is going to turn out like the young Pharisees' diners club. There's going to be bread rolls everywhere, you know? <laughs> and the chef ended up upside down in the matzos with a radish up his ass. <laughs> so anyway. I asked them if they wanted wine and beer. He tips me the nod and says, oh, they'll have water. Next thing I know, stoom, wine. And I thought, I'm not having this. So I says, hey, Beardy, don't you know there's a corkage to pay in that? <laughs> anyway, I'm just trying to remember which of them ordered the creme de menthe with the coffee and did Beardy want the liqueur? When all of a sudden there's this clattering and banging and these Roman guards burst in, shouting and screaming. And I thought, that's all I need. That is all I need. A lot of drunken squatties. <laughs> well, luckily, old Judas came up trumps because he stood up and pointed at old Beardy, sat there mumbling into his cappuccino, and he says, that's the one, boys! And they pitched in and dragged Beardy off. And, of course, then we had another shamazzle about the check. Because, of course, old Beardy was supposed to have been picking up the tan. <laughs> so I says, why not split 12 ways, boys? But they would not have it. Who had the side salad? Did you order the extra roll and butter? <laughs> and then someone discovers old Judas is loaded. He's got 30 pieces of silver from somewhere. <laughs> he says he's bugging if he's forking out because he hadn't had anything to eat. <laughs> and then there's the painter to pay, and the rush shrugging the shoulders and saying nothing to do with me, pal. And the Judas is complaining that the painter has got his nose wrong. With his nose, he's lucky he hasn't got it right. <laughs> they will pay for old Beardy's dessert because he didn't touch it. Well, finally, they cough up, and then just as they're leaving, one of them says, excuse me, this is the last supper. So I shouted after them. I said, too right, pal. That's the last supper you have in my diner. Get out of here. <laughs> so what do you have? Uh, Jenkins, Daily Telegraph. Uh, Steffi, when you broke Martino to love in the first game of the second set, uh, do you think in many ways this was the turning point in the match? Oh, yes, because up until then she was playing very well and I needed to win that game to take control. Uh, Michael Bellway, The Guardian. Steffi, would you say that by attacking the serve and playing deep to the baseline, you were able to uh, stop Martina playing her normal grass court game? Oh, sure. You know, it was important for me to stop her settling into a rhythm where she could easily have won. Big Jim, current bun, darling. I wonder if you could uh, describe for our five million readers that wonderful shot. I think it was during your fourth service game when you got past Martini with a lovely drop volley and the back of your skirt lifted to reveal your lovely... <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm sorry, I'm not quite... No, I was just wondering, I was just wondering if it reminded you of a very similar shot you played, I think it was against the Rattlin' Lover in the American Open, and your whole skirt blew up round your waist, <laughs> and you saw your lovely body. I think, I, I think, really, our readers have got the right to know, do your knickers naturally crawl up the crack in your bum, or will you wear a... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not following what you're trying to say to me. I'm sorry, love, was that a bit technical for you, was it? <laughs> All I'm saying is, you've got a very lovely body. And I feel what our, what our female readership would love to know is, with these short skirts, do you have to shave extensively in the bikini area? <laughs> oh, this is ridiculous! All right, all right. All I'm saying, all I'm saying is you've got a lovely bum, like two little plums and a hanky. Very tasty <laughs> and a bit of a tease, which is more than can be said for your nose, forgive me. <laughs> Pardon? Well, you hooter, you beat, your trumpet. It's in the large size, isn't it? I'm sorry, I am not quite following what it is you're trying to say to me. What I'm saying, Steffi, love, is, proboscically speaking, you've got a bit of a charano, haven't you? <laughs> you were asking me if I think I have a big nose? That's about the size of it. Or rather, that's about the size of it. <laughs> Steffi, no, 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 all, all I'm saying, all I'm saying, Steffi, is, from the rear, a bit tasty, but when you turn round, the boat race is a bit dodgy. Yeah. I'm being as tactful as I can. I'm sorry, I'm not prepared to sit and be spoken to like this. Oi, big nose, where do you think you're going? That's <laughs> disgusting! I know, who does she think she is? Not her, uh, you! You're ruining the reputation of the British press! Yes, if you can't ask a decent question that doesn't involve deriding someone's personal appearance, then you shouldn't ask one at all. Well, pardon me, Shakespeare. I can ask the boring questions like anyone else. Oi, hatch doom, here comes Becca. OK, so who wants to ask me a question? Uh, uh, Becca, a moment. Yeah? Who are you bonking at the moment, Boris?
it'll show I believe in my opting out policy. And I'll save my political skin. But you don't believe in it. Since when has that been a consideration in politics? <laughs> Mistress, we can't have the education minister's daughter at St. Bottles. It'll lower the tone of the whole school. I know, but it's the only way we'll get extra funding. Otherwise, it'll go to St. Trinian. The girls won't take this lying down. Mm, that'll be a change. <laughs> <laughs> no? When the minister walks through that door, I want him to see a thriving hub of education with hundreds of industrious, happy pupils. That could be a problem, headmistress. Why? There are only 15 girls in the whole school. I know. I know. And they're all bone idle. Well, you're the head girl. It's up to you to motivate them for the honour of the school. What do we get out of it? Get out of it? Get out of it? 20% of all new funding. 50. 30? And a school visit to the officer's mess at Biggin Hill? <laughs> Entree? Ah, Mr. Butcher. <laughs> Welcome to St. Bottles, the school that put the class back into the classroom. <laughs> and this must be your daughter. Charming, charming. Uh, run along, Miss Longestine. Tell the girls I'll be down to inspect their microsurgery prep presently. <laughs> microsurgery. Well, there you are, Caroline. There's a useful subject for you. So, Mrs. Birdingham. Miss, Miss, I never married. Didn't like the hours. <laughs> um, I feel like you and Caroline is going to be very happy here. I'm sure she will be. No, I won't. It's a dump. We do still have capital punishment, of course. Capital? <laughs> is it corporal? Is it corporal when they don't die? <laughs> Shall I? Getting off with a rock star. Shut up. <laughs> now listen, the education minister's sending his kid to the school. Oh, All right, shut up, that's enough. If she comes, the school will get a whacking grant and we get a percentage. Girls, <laughs> please, please. Oh, yes. Little Christine Killer. <laughs> she was here, you know, that considering the amount of time she spent in the bike sheds, it's amazing she never learned to ride one. Caroline! <laughs> Carry, Carry on, Miss Spencer. Now, the way to deal with the working classes is to order them about in a loud, hectoring manner and don't look them directly in the eye in case you catch anything. <laughs> Can we go home now? Uh, Miss Longestine, perhaps you'd like to show little Caroline the ropes while I show the minister the science lab? Mm -hmm. Come on, now, Miss Now, when meeting the working class... Shut up! <laughs> now listen, you snotty little creep. You're coming here whether you like it or not. Where should we bang the nails in? Hands or ears? <laughs> Lovely girl, Miss Spinster. Lost her fiancé during the war. In Herod's of all places. Very sad. <laughs> the science lab. Um, here we are. And that is how you do it. And what are they doing here? Oh, the girls are designing a new wing for the Boeing 737. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, it's all in a day's work for the girls of St. Bottles. <laughs> Isn't that right, Miss? Uh, aren't you the... Uh, yes, we're sisters. Identical sex tuplets. There are five of us. <laughs> five? Yes, one of them wasn't identical and was mislaid at birth. But they could never find her because nobody knew what she looked like. Come <laughs> <laughs> on, Minister, let's go and see the health centre. Now the medical centre. Um, oh, where would it be? Is it, um, uh, oh, it's in here. <laughs> and when the cells start to divide, 
Isn't that, uh... Sister, sister. It means to perform a small operation to implant the fertilized egg back inside the womb so that it can develop normally. So, Oriana, if you ask your mother to pop in next week, we'll do it for her. And we do have a fully equipped drug lab where we can make everything from aspirin to crack. <laughs> That's my little joke, Minister. After all, where's the money in aspirin? <laughs> and what happens in here? Ah, in here, the, the um... What happens in here, Lucretia? It's the advanced social skills class, where the girls learn how to put a condom on in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> this is all very impressive. And I'm sure that I can increase your funding, but it does all rather depend on whether Caroline is happy here. Oh, I'm sure she's happy. Oh, yes. Right, What's right. your name? Yeah. All right, I'll stay. <laughs> of course, the extra money will come out of the health service, but if patients die, we'll have more beds. <laughs> so they're knock-on benefits all round. Oh, I can see you've got where you are today, Minister. Mm. <laughs> You're such a clever boy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sure. No, goodbye, <laughs> Caroline. <laughs> yes, Daddy, I will. Do rest assured that every penny will be spent on turning some bottles into a shining example of your opting out policy. <laughs> Jolly good. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. 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 Right, I want 500 pounds and lucky ladies in a 330 at Chipster. <laughs> I want a new carpet for the hall, an all-sweet bathroom with jacuzzi for my study. I think we'll knock down chapel and build an indoor swimming pool. <laughs> As a foot bath, I think we'll all go and have a gym. <laughs> I can't tell you how happy we are with our decision to come down here to Wales and take over the small holding. <laughs> we had to wait until the moment was right, till Toby and Sebastian were settled at Winchester. But, I mean, the experience of living off the land with just your own hands and labours has been absolutely marvellous. I mean, knowing, knowing that if one's crop failed, then one would have literally nothing at all to eat. Well, the nearest Marks and Spencer's is nearly 40 miles. <laughs> it doesn't even have a foot hall. Of course, right here in Wales, or Cymru, as we call it, <laughs> hasn't changed for centuries, which is, is one of the things that appeal to us. I mean, our cottage hasn't even got a phone. And, you know, we've had to rely almost entirely on the fax machine. <laughs> there have been compensations, like the chance to meet real people again, like the Smiths from Sunningdale who run the traditional Welsh earthenware pottery centre down the valley. <laughs> and the Forbeses from Weybridge who operate the authentic working water mill and granary in the next village. And who sell, incidentally, that marvellous stone ground microwave cake mix. You really must try it. <laughs> Real, ordinary people like you, using their skills as they have for, ooh, nearly a month now. <laughs> and we've taken a home tutorial course in Welsh so we can speak the local language. Of course, all the Welsh people speak perfect English, so the only opportunity we actually get to speak Welsh is with the Forbeses and the Smiths. However, <laughs> we do feel a deep solidarity with the Welsh peoples. Indeed, we've burnt down a holiday cottage in sympathy. <laughs> Admittedly, it was one we actually owned ourselves. And we were almost embarrassed with the £68,000 from the insurance company. <laughs> but that's not the point. Of course, that's not to say we haven't had problems. Finding a decent man to fit a trimnasium and aqua gym was an absolute nightmare. <laughs> I know. Which is why we, we try absolutely and persuade all our friends to come down here, uh, buy a row of cottages. Well, they're so cheap, aren't they? Convert one into a bathroom and live in the other five. <laughs> Turn the barn into a squash court and join us. Well, forgive me for saying so, but the, um, the Welsh 
aren't exactly the perfect dinner party guests, are they? I mean, how, how long can one talk about closed pits? <laughs> 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 ah, Pluvius, come in, come in. Thank you, Daphne. Finish those letters off and I'll see you later. Lousy secretary, but a hell of a handmaid. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen the new viewing figures, sir? Would you like to see them again? <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Sunday night at the Londinium Palladium, 100 Christians eaten by lions, 20,000 viewers. That's good, Pluvius. Good? It's bloody miraculous for a religious programme. <laughs> well, the network's on the run, sir. Obviously, you're doing a fantastic job, but uh, I'm afraid we've got problems. Don't tell me we're running out of Christians again, sir. Are we? No, 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 no. Oh, thank God for that. It's just that uh, <laughs> our franchise is coming up for renewal, and... Uh, there's a lot of worry about sex and violence in the arena. Well, we're putting in as much as we can, sir, although... No, 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 there's too much. That's the point. The Arena Standards Authority thinks that it's a little bad taste. Bad taste? How dare they? Give me, for instance... 200 naked couples having sex while being eaten by hyenas? <laughs> they were singing! It was an opera! That's art! <laughs> What's wrong with the old, simple family entertainments? The uh, chariot races, the crucifixions? Why can't we have more of those? Oh, you're way out of date, Gus. Nobody wants crucifixions now. The public have had crucifixions up to here. <laughs> <laughs> they take far too long to die, you see. It's all right for the mums and dads. They can have a little picnic underneath the cross. But the kids of today have got a very short attention span. All they want is unfair gladiatorial combat. Stab, stab, lots of blood, into the commercial break, back in time for the zebras and the virgins. <laughs> All I'm saying is that we're under some pressure to tone things down. Ah! Sorry. <laughs> they don't have to watch. They can always toddle off down to Channel IV and watch some Greek play with subtitles. <laughs> I'm agreeing with you, Pluvius. I'm just saying that we've got to do something to keep the authorities happy. Well, what do you suggest? Games. There's this new game. Two teams come on. Naked. No, not naked. <laughs> they come on and they try to kick a bladder into a net. And the bladder with the net's got a trident. He has to try and stab them. No, no, no. They, they each have a net. Uh, they kick the bladder into the net. That's called a goal. Mm -hmm. And the team that scores the most goals wins. And the losing team get eaten by the lions. No, no nothing that. happens to them. <laughs> they, they, the winners get a cup. And the cup's full of cyanide and the losers have to no, drink it no, and no, die. No, no, just, <laughs> just go home. The ratings will go down the latrinium. <laughs> It's just until we get the franchise, then we can do what the hell we like for the next five years. Trust me, Pluvius. And then we can do what we like? Yes, lovely. Have I got a game for you? Right. Now, the whole thing is hosted by this gaudy, irritating old bag from up north, right? <laughs> She's got shoulder pads out of here like a gladiator, right? She's to be a singer of some sort. <laughs> now, there's a girl and three blokes, right? And the girl has to decide which one she wants to uh, copulate with. <laughs> but what she doesn't know is she's going to have to copulate with all three of them, whether she likes it or not, right there in the middle of the arena. What do you think of that? It's good. It's good, Pluvius, but it's a little restrained for you, isn't it? Where's the blood? Ah, well, then, at the end... Surprise, surprise. 25 <laughs> hyenas come on and tear the hostess to shreds. Brilliant! <laughs> no, don't mind if I do. <laughs> This is a normal pint of lager. This is low alcohol lager. Three pints of this contains about the same amount of alcohol as one normal pint of lager. But this, this is McGrory's extra super strength killer Omahid, most of the sugar turns to dynamite lager. <laughs> this is good night, Vienna. <laughs> In the history of rock music, there are two chapters dedicated to Elvis Presley. Other luminaries, such as The Who, are recorded one chapter. But only one artist appears as a typographical error on the erratum slip. <laughs> Robbie Wilson. Of course, I was just an ordinary working class lad, as I am now. And, uh, me and a few mates thought, why not form a band? I remember the lineup was Mike Partridge, me, and a bloke called Danny O'Brien, who'd left school with 10 O-levels. But he was made to return them, because they weren't his. <laughs> and uh, that was essentially part. We got our first gigs in the grotto in Dagenham. 
I would play bass and Mike would play bass and Danny would play bass. <laughs> That was our big drawback initially. Uh, we all played bass. But they were able to amicably sort out their bass problem and started to make a name for themselves playing everything from American R&B to British B&B, &B, a tough, brutal music detailing the appalling cruelty and hardship of bed and breakfast accommodation in Margate. Oh, flush the toilet on the past never coming back. To again. Oh, no. Robbie was now to change his image radically and lose an enormous amount of weight. No, no, no. But by the time Flower Power came along, he had put it all back on again. <laughs> They appeared in a free concert in Hyde Park, as a result of which many in the audience demanded their money back. So, well, we're dedicating this gig to the memory of Dennis, who you may have heard died tragically three weeks ago. Isn't that right, Dennis? Yeah, this is true. I don't know it's uh, too early to say yet whether I'm going to leave the band or not. Oh, cos <laughs> Anyway, in his memory, and as a symbol of universal love and peace, the highlight of our gig is that we're going to release 24 white doves above the audience. I'd have liked that. Unfortunately, the doves had all suffocated in the box. And Robbie was almost beaten to death with a make love, not war placard. <laughs> Robbie was to change direction again and would next seek influence from the music of David Bowie, calling himself the Fat White Duke. and releasing the Major Palm and the Spiders from Lars album, which traced the story of an Australian astronaut lost in space and coming across an alien life force masquerading as a Swedish family in Gothenburg. It was not a success. Then only three years after punk had died out, they scored with the single Anarchy in the Retail Hosiery Industry. Significantly, it was to knock Joe Dolce's Shut Up Your Face off the number one spot. And as a result, he was awarded a Victoria Cross from the Queen. But now came a new crisis, which threatened to end Robbie's career even faster than the band's problems and his own obvious lack of talent, video. For his first video, his record company had a brilliant idea of showing lots of girls in rather skimpy dresses who pouted a lot. But the effect was spoiled by the unfortunate appearance of Robbie himself towards the end. was at a crossroads and found himself facing a new horizon, a new band, and a new girlfriend in the form of shapely 12-year-old schoolgirl Linda Lawsuit. Although he thought himself safe from state prosecution, Robbie was to fall foul of a law introduced during the coal dispute and was convicted of transporting a minor across county borders. But for many, his career was revived by his appearance at Live Aid. 
Hot dogs, sauce creams, get the souvenir postage kick. He was, however, to reach his lowest point when, in a moment of madness, he agreed to host the 1988 Brit Awards. So the award for the best female artist. And the winner is Robbie. Great, Robbie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> and the winner is Robbie. I don't have it. Before moving right on, will you please welcome our wonderful new band, Get Off Quickly Robbie! It seemed his career couldn't recover. But finally, he was to have his second number one when one of his early records was adopted as the background music for the fabulously successful Odor Eater ads. And here, playing it tonight, will you please welcome Robbie Wilson and Sedgley Park. Well, I've been a rock and roller for 25 years. I'm losing my loins, but I'm deaf in my ears. Crazy, give myself a lot of harm. I ended up growing mushrooms on an organic farm. Well, I'm gonna set out on a new adventure before I start suffering from senile dementia. I'm going on the road with a brand new band. And just as soon as I've sorted out my prostate plan, in the sixties we were wild, never did what we were told. In the 70s, we still hoped that we would die before we got too old. And now we're in the 80s, and hey, I'm not so sure. I've got a really good pension plan, and it's about to mature. Hey, Joe! Hotel rooms, rubies lined up at the door, staying up till 11.30, doing things I didn't order, not gonna be any drinking drugs, I'm gonna hit the 